Welcome to God Bearing People. Again, my name is Mach or Melissa. Feel free to call me whatever name you're comfortable calling me. Guys, we are in the third book of the Bible and my third presentation, the book of Leviticus. This happens to be one of my favorite presentations. So I hope you guys enjoy what I have for you today. So a lot of people ask me, hey, why do you call your presentations God Bearing People in your ministry? Hops and hope. You know, in uh, Psalm 104, verse 15, it tells us that wine is an earthly joy. It gladdens the heart of man. But also in the Proverbs, it tells us that wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So you have two things here you have something that can gladden your heart, and then you have the other that can lead you astray so be cautious of that you know it's interesting that the latin word for alcohol it's spiritus that word is used for the highest religious experience as well as the most depraving poison this swiss psychiatrist his name's carl jung and he believed that alcohol was a spiritual disease and his research sparked this program perhaps you've heard of it it's called alcoholics anonymous if you don't know what alcoholics anonymous is it's a 12-step program that is designed to create a spiritual experience my favorite author his name's m scott peck if you haven't read this book i i challenge you guys to read it it's called the road less traveled but in that book dr peck wrote it's no accident that we refer to alcoholic drinks as spirits so if you're ever driving down the road and you see a sign that says now serving wine beer and spirits he wrote that perhaps alcoholics were people who had a greater thirst for the spirit so as you know hops and hope and god bearing people we don't promote drunkenness we don't promote alcoholism um, in fact we promote god's love god's mercy and god's truth so if you are struggling with an addiction my hope is that you can hear god's word god's love god's mercy and god's truth in these presentations so i welcome you guys to the book of leviticus there's your roadmap of where we'll be going with these presentations so far we've done the book of genesis the book of exodus today we will be in the book of leviticus so we've gone through the first three books of the five books of moses Here's what you've missed so far. In Genesis chapter 1, we have the creation of the heavens and the earth. We have the creation of mankind in chapter 2. Everything was perfect up until chapter 3. We call it the fall. It's man's separation from God. In the garden, Adam and Eve had access to the tree of life. God said, from any of the trees you may eat, but do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil they did and that sin that rebellion produced this separation from god however god gives us this redemption or this salvation plan in genesis chapter 3 15 it's the first good news that someone is coming to give us back that eternal life that we lost in the garden so now we must track where this someone is coming from and that starts in chapter 12 with this gentleman named abraham god makes a covenant that says i will make you a great nation and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants that was reaffirmed with abraham's grandson israel now there's 12 sons that israel had and they're now grouped as 12 tribes so we're following where is this someone coming from within those 12 tribes and within that nation so these 12 tribes grow as the israelites and they are enslaved in egypt now the lord frees them from bondage he says i am the lord your god who brought you out of egypt and they're given these 10 commandments the first four commandments this is how you have a relationship with god and the other six commandments here's how to have relationships with other people they're also given these various case 
laws. Now, as a group, as a nation, they enter into this covenant or this promise with God. They agree to the Ten Commandments and these various case laws. So far, what we've learned in the book of Genesis, we have the fall of man. In the book of Exodus, man is redeemed. God's approach to man, I am the Lord, your God. In this book, in the book of Leviticus, we'll learn a man's approach to God, man worshiping God through these various offerings. So we'll learn what those offerings are here shortly. So the book of Exodus ends with this tabernacle being built. Now this is the place where they'll have this relationship with God. Tabernacle is this dwelling place of God. So in this book, they will be going into this tabernacle and having this relationship with God. The actual definition of a covenant, it's a solemn blood sealed agreement that establishes and regulates a formal binding relationship between clearly de defined parties. The best way to describe that is it's a contract. So in your Bible, if you want to put next to covenant contract, that might help you better understand. Like any contract, there are parties involved. In this Bible story, the parties involved is the nation of Israel and God. Now, like any contract, there's terms and agreements. So there's duties and responsibilities, for example, those Ten Commandments and those various case laws. Now, right now, if you don't own your car, you're probably making a car payment. Well, if you stop making your car payment, what happens? Your car will get repossessed. Well, just like this covenant, there are promises and curses. There's rewards for keeping the covenant and there's penalties for violating the covenant. So the Israelites and God, they are bound to this agreement and this arrangement. They seal it in animal blood. So it's basically their way of signing on the dotted line, if that helps you understand it. So in Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 through 8, describes what this signing on the dotted line is, or this blood of the covenant. An animal was sacrificed and split in two. Now that sounds brutal, but that's the seriousness of a promise and a covenant because that split animal gave a visual of what should happen to you if you didn't keep the covenant. The animal represented you. By committing a sin, you should be put to death. But God accepted this animal substitute as a payment for a particular sin. So why an innocent animal? Well, let's bring it back to the garden. Sin causes death. We've learned that. In the book of Genesis, we talked about Adam and Eve having access to the tree of life. When they separated themselves from God by sin, they also were separated from the tree of life. So as the story goes, they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And after they ate, what happened? Their eyes were opened. Do you guys remember? And they covered themselves up with fig leaves. And later in the story, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it tells us that the Lord clothed them with skin. So they're no longer wearing fig leaves. They're now clothed with animal skin. So this is God providing a covering for them. This is the first we hear of a, quote, sacrifice to cover up the sin of the guilty. So God mercifully providing a covering for them. You know what's interesting is the Hebrew word for cover on your screen, kapor, translates to atonement. Atonement meaning compensation or payments. So you didn't have to pay for it, but this animal did. This animal was your atonement or payment or compensation or cover up for a particular sin. Innocent animal's death was not just a reminder of sin's consequences, 
its life was offered as a symbolic substitute. We later find out in this Bible story that the innocent blood of Christ was the payment or was the atonement or was the covering for our sins. Again, God providing a covering for us. So in this story at this time in the Old Testament, an animal was sacrificed to cover sin. In the New Testament, Jesus, often called the Lamb of God, was offered up as a sacrifice to cover our sins. So fortunately, there's no need to do these animal sacrifices anymore. But to understand where we are in the Bible story, that may help you understand why these animals were used as a substitute for your life, a life for a life, ultimately Jesus fulfilling the ultimate sacrifice a life for a life here's a quick blueprint of what the tabernacle or the dwelling place of god would look like so when you enter you encounter the altar of sacrifice or altar of burnt offering beyond that is where a priest would wash themselves with water before they could enter into the holy place so here we have the holy place and then we have this veil that separates the holy place from the Holy of Holies. So this is the most sacred place. It houses the Ark of the Covenant. It's like this small box designed for the safekeeping of the Ten Commandments. Here's what it would look like constructed. So again, that altar of burnt offering, again, where the priests would wash themselves. We have the holy place. Then we have the Holy of Holies. And then you can see in the very back, that's the Ark of the Covenant. The best way to think about this tabernacle, it's like a pop-up church. The Israelites are going to be traveling from Mount Sinai to the Promised Land of Canaan. And they'll be popping this up and taking it down and popping it up and taking it down as they travel through the wilderness. Currently, the Israelites are still at Mount Sinai. They have not left Mount Sinai yet, but they will be, and they'll be taking this tabernacle through the wilderness as they travel to the promised land. All right, we had to learn a lot before we even opened up our book, chapters one through seven. Mostly we needed to understand the seriousness of the covenant. We also needed to understand why we perform these animal sacrifices at this time so again that sacrifice is this relationship with god it's something that people are going to bring to god so first is the burnt offering it's expressing devotion to god now a bull a ram or a male bird would be offered up now the priest would lay his hand on the on the head of the animal before the sacrifice next we have is this grain offering this is actually the only offering that there is no shedding of blood. You were to provide the finest flour. It's, it's unleavened bread or bread without yeast or bread without honey. The reason they say, hey, don't have honey is it can be an aid to fermentation. So no yeast, no honey. We have this peace offering. Now it can be an animal from the herd if it's a lamb or if it's a goat. Either way, the priest is to lay his hand on the animal's head before the offering. These three offerings are voluntary acts of worship. Now, they're not tied to a specific occasion or a specific act. They're just acts of praise and thanksgiving. However, these next two sacrifices are offered in connection with a specific occasion or a specific sin. So again, we have this sin offering. You were to present a bull, goat, lamb, dove, or pigeon. The priest would lay his hand on its head before the offering. Make note that these offerings do not take away sin. They only offer forgiveness. So they don't take away sin. They only provide forgiveness we have the final offering it's called the guilt offering it's sinning unintentionally so it's sin committed and ignorance so you were to pay a 20 percent fine and you were to offer up a ram now the priest would lay his hand on the ram's head before the sacrifice notice how i keep repeating laying the hands on the head the laying of hands 
on the head in the Bible is an act of designation. So it's a symbol of transfer. You'll read the Bible story later on when it's time for Moses to designate his successor, which is Joshua. He'll lay his hand on Joshua's head and then designate him as the successor. So here in this story, the priest is laying his hands on the head of the animal and the transfer here is I designate this animal to take place of sin. An animal is dying as a substitute for you. So that's why I keep repeating the laying hands on the head. All right, so you may be asking what sin ha is so bad that God took my place on the cross or what sin is so bad that at this time these innocent animals were being sacrificed well let's go into what god identifies or what god has revealed to us to be against his will so it starts in exodus chapter 34 verse 7 we're given three terms in which god has identified as sin however these are sins god's willing to forgive the first is iniquity. Now, all of these terms, if you were to Google iniquity, this is what would pop up as the definition. Immoral or grossly unfair behavior. We have transgression, an act that goes against a law, rule, or code of conduct. So that's an offense. We have sin, an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. These three terms, iniquity, transgression, and sin, God said he's willing to forgive. Jesus affirmed that in the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 28 through 29. I'll read the verse. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. We understand that the unforgivable sin is rejecting the Holy Spirit and having an arrogant, stubborn heart. So pride is at the root of this unforgivable sin, this rejecting of the Holy Spirit, which I can understand because what we've learned is that pride is what kicked us out of the garden. Pride was the first sin. What is sin? Violating your conscience which aligns with iniquity on your screen i have iniquity in parentheses i have deviation and perversion definition for deviation going a different way than the common way so we all have like this i would hope some of us have this right and wrong uh jiminy cricket inside of our hearts what's well, going against that we have this perversion. The definition for that is corruption of what was first intended. So it's distortion or again, corruption. What is sin? It's commission. It's failing to obey God's instructions. Again, this aligns with transgression, which in, is rejection, which is rebellion. What is sin? It's omission, failing to do the right things we know we should do. This aligning with just missing the mark, falling short. You know, I should have did that and I just didn't do that. It's failing to do the right things we know we should do. Now, throughout these presentations, I tried to give you guys a skeletal structure of the Bible story. So I don't necessarily go into all the ins and outs of the Bible story. My hopes is just to give you the baseline um, and a foundation in which you can open your Bible and read these stories. So I hope you've read this story in Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I didn't go over that uh, story in my presentations, but I'm going to bring it up today because it's important to what we're learning right now. So if you don't know the story, I'll give you a background. These two angels came to the city of Sodom and they knock on Lot's door. Now Lot is Abraham's nephew. Lot feeds them and he invites them to stay overnight. Now Lot is showing exceptional hospitality. Now mind you, Middle Eastern custom 
says that a guest in anyone's home were more honorable and treated more highly than family members. So that kind of explains what happens next. Some thugs surround Lot's house and they start banging on his door and those thugs say to Lot, bring out those men. We want to gang rape them. And Lot says, guys, don't gang rape my gentlemen guests. In fact, I have two daughters who are virgins and you can do whatever to them. Somehow in this story, society focuses on the homosexual act and they just bat an eye to the fact that Lot just offered up his daughters to be gang raped. Some people try to justify it. Well, that was Middle Eastern custom at that time. I've also heard people bring up the anatomical differences between a male and a female. That doesn't make it any more right that because it would anatomically fit that it's okay for Lot to offer up his daughters. That's, that's insane to me if you believe that to be true. I'm not going to argue either case because I'm just going to go into what the Bible said the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah were. It's in Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 49. It tells us what their sin was. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. So based off of what we've learned, if it were homosexuality in which some people would call it deviation, which is going a different way than the common way, in which some people would call it perversion, which would be corruption of what was first intended. If it were homosexuality, that would have been forgiven based on what we've learned. If it were selfishness for hoarding food, for not seeking their daily bread, that would be commission, failing to obey God's instructions. Okay, so if it were just failing to do the right thing, that would be sin. So what was Sodom and Gomorrah's sin? It was pride. It was arrogance. It was having this defiant, despising, stubborn heart. Isn't it interesting that the LGBTQ plus community call it pride? And I agree with Jesus. It is pride. Pride and arrogance is the real abomination. So my hope is that if you are a part of the LGBTQ plus community, that God loves you. Jesus died for you. You are welcome in his kingdom. If you are willing to deny yourself and take up the cross, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Don't live your life apart from God. Don't live your life in pride. The Bible doesn't say for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life unless you are gay. It does not say that. It says whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life so my hope and my ask for you all and i've said this once and i'll continually say it i don't want you to let the church determine your relationship with god do not let other christians determine your relationship with god jesus said follow him we have learned what sin is god is greater this is the god that spoke the world into existence all right now that i cleared the room let's get back to the book of leviticus chapters 8 through 10 so duties of the priesthood now aaron and his sons are made sacred with the tabernacle but they end up dying i don't know if they were goofing around and not taking the offering or the sacrifice serious because they offered up something that was uncalled for and that's when god instructs the priest to abstain from strong drink it is allowed in the book of deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 26 it is allowed for others but for the priests they are to abstain from it for the purpose of being sober and clear-headed 
in uh, teaching God's word. That's what's happening in those chapters. In chapter 11, you're going to read about ceremonial cleanliness. Now, these laws or this law not only defined the way the Israelites were to serve God, it was to keep them holy and separate from surrounding cultures. God wanted them to stand out. The way that the Israelites lived were reminders of their status as a distinct people of God. So the way they planted fields, the way they dressed, the way they trimmed their hair were all physical reminders of their status as people of God. Chapter 16, Israel's annual atonement ceremony called Yom Kippur. Now, there's that word that we learned, Kippur, meaning cover, which translates to atonement, so payment for sins. So every year, there's this day of atonement. It actually is still practiced today in Judaism. So it's the holiest day in Judaism. The high priest makes atonement for the nation's sin. Atonement day was really meant to deal with the transgressions or the intentional sins of the nation. So it's a day of repentance. It's a day of fasting and it's a day of prayer. So we learn in Christianity that Jesus is is the ultimate high priest and Jesus made atonement for our sins. Bigger message that Leviticus chapter 16 teaches us is this atonement that Jesus paid for it already. So it's already atoned for, meaning the debt has been paid off for all of humanity. All right, my favorite part is this part. Someone is coming throughout the entire Old Testament. We have this theme, this plot, this essence that someone is coming. And it started in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, animal sacrifices promise forgiveness, but it never took away sin. Now, I'm not saying that those animal deaths were meaningless. Yes, they offered forgiveness but not remission or not cancellation of debt. So forgiven, but sins not taken away. The good news that we have is fulfilled in the New Testament that Jesus fulfilled the law. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, it tells us the new covenant, no need for animal sacrifices. We learn that salvation cannot be earned. We are forgiven by repenting of sins and trusting in the completed work of Jesus Christ, the shedding of his blood. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for there it is, remission of sin. So the cancellation of debt. Remember Eve signed us up for this long interest loan? Well, Jesus paid that off. He is our atonement or our compensation or our payment for that. So this book or the Mosaic law, its purpose is to identify sin. So in the New Testament or in the New Covenant in Romans chapter 7 verse 7, It says, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So I wouldn't know what covet meant unless I read the Old Testament and said, thou shalt not covet. So I would not know what covet meant, but the law taught covetedness. These rules no longer apply is what I'm saying. We are covered. By the blood of Jesus, his death and his blood is the real atonement or real payment for all human sin. So Hebrews, again, in the New Testament, and I'm sorry if you've not read the Bible before, uh, I just want you to understand that we no longer have to be bound to these laws. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 tells us we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So the offering or the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So no longer must we practice these things. It is finished. Jesus said it on the cross. 
So if you guys are really geeking out like I love to geek out, go to Hebrews chapter 8 and it'll kind of describe the whole new covenant that we entered in with Christ. So to return to this old system is really to return to something that is no longer valid or no longer effective. Chapter 17, you're going to read about this atonement blood. So the Israelites actually can eat meat but with restrictions domestic animals must be killed at the tabernacle and you say why domestic animals well they're obedient to man which is really a reflection of jesus being obedient to the father the other restriction is do not eat the blood because the blood represented life so for the life of a creature is in its blood so it's really teaching that atonement involves the substitution of life for a life now in chapter 18 it says don't follow the sexual practices of neighboring nations now remember these laws serve the purpose of differentiating the jewish people from the non-jewish people the gentiles this book is about holiness remember the whole goal is the israelites were to go into this nation they are to serve this God. This God would bless this nation and surrounding nations would hopefully want to serve this God. So this book is reminding the reader that the Israelites were called to be distinct, to be like their God. So it's preparing the nation to live in God's presence. So they're given all these various laws the if the israelites were to break any of these laws he or she was considered to be breaking the entire law so i don't want you to fixate on one law versus the other is what i'm saying you can't pick and choose what verses you want to use it's all or nothing scholars try to group these laws into categories and there's no distinction in the bible meaning this law is no longer relevant, but yet this law is. So I hope you understand that the content was originally meant to instruct the new nation of Israel on proper worship and right living so that they might reflect the character of the divine king. But if you've read the Bible story before, you understand that they couldn't follow the law at all. Let's go into the new covenant. Peter says neither we nor our ancestors have been able to fulfill the law acts chapter 11 verse 9 the lord says to peter do not call anything impure that god has made clean now at that time peter thought god was talking about clean and unclean meat referencing the book of Leviticus chapter 11. That's what Peter thought God was talking about. Now, Peter is apostle, by the way. He later realized a deeper meaning and goes on to say in verse 28, God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Man, this guy gets it. So in verse 34 of that same chapter, I now realize how true it is that God does not show partiality, does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Bam, guys, there it is. The one who denies himself and takes up the cross. So the greater message here is what's been consistent throughout the Bible story. You don't get into heaven because of what you do. You get into heaven because what Jesus did for you. So when you're challenged with decisions like well should i eat pork should i not eat pork should i go to my gay cousin's wedding or should i not because the bible says like read your bible it says whatever you do do it for the glory of god it's a true act of what would jesus do it's really that simple so when you make a choice is it a choice that promotes your religion that promotes your lifestyle, that promotes your church rules, or is it a choice that promotes Jesus's love, Jesus's mercy, Jesus's impartiality, 
It's really that simple. I don't know why people make this stuff that difficult. Fortunately, we aren't bound by these laws. The blood and the atonement of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, has covered that for us. The book of Leviticus chapters 21 through 22 are more duties of the priesthood. So here's a key to understanding the role of a priest. The priests are to present God to the people and the people to God. So sacrifices were brought to the Lord, but the priests were authorized representatives of him. So they must be careful in retaining their ceremonial and moral purity. Now we have chapters 23 through 25 discuss the Passover. Remember God in the book of Exodus, God passed over the houses that were covered by the blood. So this is a feast that commemorates the deliverance out of Egypt. And then we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Feast of Bread with No Yeast. You know what's interesting? It, what yeast does to bread is it puffs up the bread. And just going back to my irony of like arrogance and puffed up chest, it's no wonder why God says bread with no yeast. Pentecost is uh, 50 days after the Passover, so it commemorates the giving of laws, the Ten Commandments and the laws in uh, this book of Leviticus. It's also a festival of joy, showing thankfulness for the Lord's blessing of harvest. And then we have the Feast of Tabernacles, and it's a week-long celebration. It's commemorating their journey from the wilderness to the promised land of Canaan. Now, chapter 26 are blessings and penalties for disobedience. If Israel was faithful to the covenant, they would be greatly blessed as they lived in the promised land. They'd have plenty of food. They'd have good health. They'd have peace. They'd experience God's presence. However, if they failed to love God and keep his covenant, that contract that would bring loss of potential blessings loss of food loss of peace loss of god's presence and chapter 27 are laws on vows basically there's a penalty if you retract on your vows so it's really highlighting the importance of the covenant we finished the book of leviticus and i promise i try to make these presentations fun but Leviticus, like I said, was probably the most choppy and just very, very, uh, just hearty. Did my best to break it down. So here's the key truths. What can we take directly from this book? So the key to blessings is obedience. Offerings. This book talks a lot about this relation with God. We can do that today by offering up prayers, offering up tithings, offering up our time, maybe to volunteer, to do something outside of ourselves to fulfill God's will. This book is about feasts, uh, remembering God's law. We still do that today with the Feast of Thanksgiving. Or how about Christmas dinner, honoring that God came into this world? Or the ultimate message of Leviticus, the message to Israel. It teaches the Israelites how to worship in their new tabernacle. And what can we take from it? There's still a message for us here in the book of Leviticus, and it shows us that the ultimate blood sacrifice points to Jesus Christ. Thank God we don't have to do all of these things. Jesus did it for us. Remember these pictures? Oh my gosh, this one's probably the worst. It's left foot a kiss. Leviticus, left foot a kiss. Anyway, the priest and the Levites balanced on one foot, two key leadership roles, feasts, okay, feasts and offerings. That's what this book is about, feasts and offerings.